Welcome to the Rudin Report podcast. I'm Dave Rudin. We're coming live after several months again from the spectacular studios here at the Westport Library. Uh, really looking forward to trying to tape as many of these podcasts as possible from here. And we're actually changing the format for the first time since I started doing the podcast. I've always always wanted, besides the interview, to have the opportunity to sort of offer my own analysis, commentary, talk about things that are going on in the league. And it's kind of difficult to do when you don't have experience in doing this and you're the only one talking. So uh, I know I needed a partner if I was going to be able to make this podcast what I really want to make the podcast. And so I went out and uh, I think everybody outside of New Canaan got to know what everybody inside of New Canaan has known for the last few years over the winter time here. I sought out uh, the preeminent uh, student broadcaster in the area, and that's New Canaan's Ian Nicholas, who's going to be my co-host going forward. Ian, thanks a lot for doing this. Thanks a lot for having me, Dave. Love Westport. Love working with the Rudin Report. Used to live in East Norwalk, so familiar with the area, familiar with the library. First time in the podcast studio. Really happy to be here, and I'm really happy to be your co-pilot and uh, help tell the people around Fairfield County all the good news when it comes to uh, this spring sports season. The studio is pretty cool, isn't it? It really is. I mean, New Canaan High School, we have a well-funded little program with our podcast studio, but this is top of the line, and uh, it, I really feel at home right here. Okay, well, welcome aboard. It's nice to have you. Thank you. So we got a good podcast for you. We've got an interview I taped yesterday with Staples baseball coach Jack McFarland uh, coming off the Wreckers opening day 6 nothing win over Darien. And I guess, Ian, uh, maybe a good place to start is uh, Saturday was opening day and maybe we can bounce around a little bit and just sort of sort of talk on, on some of the things that happened and uh, – how that portends for what's going to happen going forward this spring. Sure. Well, the talk of a town when you talk about uh, FCAC baseball and really Connecticut baseball is going to be running through Westport and Staples and every team you've talked about it a lot and what you've written so far, every team seems to have their ace and the ace of aces in the FCAC right now is Carter Kelsey. He threw a no hitter with uh, through six innings with 12, uh, 12 strikeouts and he looks fantastic. Darianna, a solid team in their own right. And he really did not give them a chance to put up a fight. Wilton, uh, excuse me, Staples, they did what they needed to do offensively to get the win with those six runs. But Carter Kelsey, the Seton Hall commit, he is really going to make things run for Staples. But he's more than just that. There's a reason why they were the number one team heading into the, uh, heading into the season, according to that game time CT poll. They have more players than just Kelsey. Yeah, Staples is deep. Staples has been the top program in the FCAC the last few years. Uh, and, and there have been a lot of good programs. We're going through a golden age right now with FCAC baseball with so many good teams. It seems everybody's got a good pitcher. Everybody's got players. And, uh, yeah, I wanted to get to Carter Kelsey, who just was fantastic. I was over at Staples, covered the boys lacrosse game, but I wanted to see both Staples and Darianne and spent about three and a half innings there. And Kelsey was just overpowering uh, yeah, Darium, which has, I think, uh, a very strong team. A lot of difficulty making contact. And the one thing, and uh, it comes up a little bit in my interview with Jack, is Kelsey, it's, it's no trickery. It's just I'm throwing smoke. The ball's coming at you. Hit it. And... Uh, Darian didn't have a very good job doing it, a no-hitter combined with Matt Spada. And uh, I suspect a lot of teams are going to have difficulty hitting him this year. As Staples, Alex Oppenheimer at shortstop, another key player, hit a home run. And uh, right now the, the Wreckers are the team to beat. And outside of Staples, uh, especially after seeing what you saw on Saturday, who do you feel can give them a push of a number one team in the state right now in the rankings in Fairfield County? And every team's got their talent. They are the most complete team. They have been one of the most complete teams in the county over the last few years. But did any team's performances on Saturday uh, prove to you that there are some guys here that could potentially give Staples a run for their money? 
I think the league is really deep. Again, uh, and baseball is one of those sports where we, you know, once we get to the playoffs, uh, it's, it's one game and done where uh, the best team doesn't necessarily win in a, in a one and out in baseball. It's the one sport it really doesn't work. But uh, I, I had Fairfield Ward second in, in my own personal preseason look. And I've been talking a lot about this being the year of the pitcher. And Ward is going to have one of the best offensive teams, I think, in the league. They beat Danbury 10-8, and they have one of the league's best players in Roman DiGiacomo, the catcher, who's going to be headed to Duke. So Wilton's one team that you want to keep an eye on. I think Greenwich, which hasn't had a chance to play yet, the Cardinals are going to, are going to be really deep. <clears throat> one of the best pitching staffs in the league. They've had two postponements, and they'll open the season tomorrow, finally. And I think that's a team to keep an eye on. Wilton was was a team that kind of slipped through the preseason unnoticed. Not a lot of people talked about them. And uh, in, in a classic pitcher's duel to open the season in, in a big rivalry game, Wilton beat Ridgefield 1-0, Nevin Belanger, through a one hitter over six innings, and and the Tigers are another team that that's going to be tough. I I got some messages uh, via social media from a couple of Ridgefield players for not putting them in my top five, and Luke Barrientos is another one of their top pitchers, and he threw a two hitter, struck out seven, so he was a really tough luck loser. I'm, there are so many good teams. I, Norwalk had a real impressive win, 16-4 over West Hill. Uh, Fairfield Ludlow, I think, is is going to be a really good team again. It's so hard. Uh, Trumbull, I haven't even mentioned Trumbull. We had Brian Krause, who, who struck out 14 in a 5-1 win over St. Joseph. So it's, it's, it's really tough. I, I, think it's, I think you're going to have a lot of good teams. I think there's a lot of parity. And I think there's just a lot of unknowns. Coaches are talking about how it's really difficult to assess the league and, and their, own, their own personnel and having a really difficult time just scouting other teams because nobody knows anybody right now. You have uh, two classes of players who, who haven't played varsity ball yet. So uh, baseball also is, is one of the sports, unlike, say, boys lacrosse, that – has a lot of familiar returning names. Baseball, just uh, we don't know many of the players. So I, I think it's going to be a great year. I'll, it was such a beautiful day. I don't remember the opening day of spring sports for me personally being as excited, exciting as it was. And obviously that, that had a lot to do with the contrast of being cooped up all winter. Well, you were talking about how beautiful that day was on Saturday, and really we sat on the uh, opposite end of the world here on a gloomy Monday. But luckily we got the... Uh, we're inside in the comforts of Westport Library, no problems with the rain. Some games will are delayed today because of rain delay, but one last note on the baseball world. Early in this week, what are some of the matchups that you're looking most forward to between maybe some of the top teams and maybe some matchups that some FCAC fans, in your opinion, these will be games that you will be covering and they should get excited about uh, for uh, this great start to the spring season? Well, the game I was going to go to today and uh – we just had a little bit of uh, conflict. We're making sure we got the studio here. Hopefully Monday, Monday is going to be a podcast day, but uh, Ward is going to be playing uh, West Hill. So that, that's one game of interest to me. Uh, Ward, has, Ward has Hell Week this week. They play Ridgefield on Wednesday, and they play Norwalk on Friday. Norwalk's another team. Yet You have 16 teams in the league I send out preview information to the coaches in terms of what I'm asking for them to send back to me to learn the league, and I ask them to put their top five teams in order, and 11 of the 16 teams got to mention. Uh, that, that's never happened before. I think, I think that's A, teams not really knowing, coaches not knowing the league yet, and B, probably having a lot of good teams and probably – those 11 teams will probably have 11 teams battling for those eight FCAC tournament spots. Yep, definitely. It's good to see that we will have not only FCACs this year in full form, but we're also going to have a full state tournament for the first time since the 20. 20- 
19 fall season, so great to, or 2018 fall season, the first time we're going to have a full state tournament. So it's going to be hopefully a beautiful spring. There will be COVID problems. Obviously, we've already seen a few of them. But before we touch on those COVID problems, let's switch from baseball to lacrosse. And you were speaking about top teams in the baseball world. Well, two of the top teams in the state, they matched up on Saturday, also at Staples High. The sixth ranked team heading in, the Staples Records, an up-and-coming program coached by a former New Canaan assistant, the former defensive coordinator at New Canaan, battling Chip Buzzy owned the New Canaan Rams, the number three ranked team in the state heading into the game and you would probably pick New Canaan to win but Staples proving no rust after nearly the two-year break defeating New Canaan really with ease they got the lead early and they never let go of it final score seven to three shutting down New Canaan limiting Chris Kinnett New Canaan star midi to three goals and everyone else to nothing and what were the keys to the game for Staples not only to come out hot defensively but to end the game so well and really shut down New Canaan's other options guys like Ryan Coyone, Nick Stiles, Harry A. Pelton, Callum Wood, they made a limited impact, and Staples, they really pounced on that end defensively. Yeah, it's, it's saying something when we talk about holding Chris Kinnett to three goals. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's really what it is. You, know, he's, you talk about the best players in the state. Uh, Chris is definitely in the conversation. And, and as you were alluding to Will Kishansky, the Staples coach who's done a great job there. Now, I came into the game based on everything I heard. And New Canaan obviously has the tradition. And you would look at history and say they're the favorite. I really thought the game was a little bit of an unknown because this is probably the best Staples team that they've ever had. They're they're really strong. They got players everywhere. Uh they had six six different players score. Uh, Charlie Howard was one of their top returning scorers. He had one goal. Uh, the revelation in the game was J.P. Kosakowski in goal, who had 14 saves. He was just magnificent, and he was the reason that Staples was able to play with the lead for such a long period of time. And Henry Dodge did a great job on draw control, and Staples really dominated time of possession and New Canaan just hardly saw the ball had trouble when they had the ball they made a lot of unforced errors which are uncharacteristic and I mean I, I anybody who's going to write off New Canaan don't they're they're really talented and Staples has a really good team I mean Darian Darian's the favorite right now but uh you know we have teams Two through five, and I don't even know how to rank them right now. We got, you know, I put Ridgefield at number two, and that's where New Canaan goes on Thursday. So it's going to be, that's going to be an interesting game. And uh, New Canaan, uh, Ridgefield, excuse me, has a, a lot of players back who actually contributed two years ago. Staples and then Wilton, which is coming off uh, a great win over Glastonbury Saturday night. Those five teams are going to be battling it out. And I know with lacrosse, the one real disappointment this year is we love those out-of-state games and uh, seeing the best of Connecticut go against the best of New York, best of Long Island, best of this area. We're not going to have that this year. But we're going to have those five teams banging heads against each other. And they're also going to be banging heads with Brunswick, which is number four in the country. So... Uh, even though with boys, and, and the same is true with girls lacrosse, even though we're not going to have the out-of-state games that we love those Saturday afternoons, uh, we're going to have a lot of good games this year. And you know what we will have this year, even though we, we won't have the out-of-state games, we will have multiple matchups between the top teams. I know on the boys' side, just from New Canaan's point of view schedule-wise, and I bet this holds true for a lot of other teams, New Canaan plays Richfield twice, once at home, once on the road. They're going to get another chance at Staples, once at home, once at, uh, on the road. They're going to play the top teams multiple times, and especially in a year where you're going to have a full FCAC tournament and you're going to have a full state tournament, multiple meetings ups with those top teams getting more and more film on guys who as you alluded to earlier we've never seen on film before they've never been in a program those multiple meetups are really going to be bigger than ever and more important than ever to coaching staffs this year uh, the funny thing is you got a whole bunch of other good programs you got the two fairfield schools ward and ludlow all these teams are building up their programs so well and you don't know about it because there's still a gap between the 
five top teams, just how talented they are. So, uh, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be interesting. Uh, and then, actually, as we as we sit here on Monday afternoon, we do have a little little bit of news that we're gonna have throughout the spring, and it's really unfortunate. But uh, you know, I saw before I came here over the state schedules, the New Canaan girls lacrosse team, which obviously you're very familiar with, uh, unfortunately is in quarantine for two weeks and. Uh, I was actually going to go work on on a story with them. Uh, they were supposed to open against Fairfield Ludlow tomorrow. They had a game coming up against Daniel Hand, and uh, we saw it in the winter time. We saw it in the fall. There are going to be some teams that are going to be forced into quarantine. Uh, it's nobody's fault. Uh, sometimes it's 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 nobody's fault. I, there's no scarlet letter to. It's it's just really sad, unfortunate. It's a short season. Having to miss two weeks is is just awful. And whatever the cause, we're looking forward to seeing them back out on the field because, uh, by all accounts, this is a Darien New Canaan year. Most certainly, New Canaan, again, with another phenomenal team this year. It's a shame. We've already seen a couple of COVID shutdowns so far <coughs> earlier in the year. Greenwich, uh, Greenwich boys team, I know is on hold for a few weeks, and that really hurt the New Canaan. New Canaan went in the best Staples game blind on the boys' side. And then on the girls' side, as you mentioned, the Harden sisters, two of the top players in the state, both committed to North Carolina to continue their careers. Both of them were all FCAC and all state players, and it's a shame that we're not going to be able to get to see them early on in a year. Courtney O'Connell, a three-sport athlete, she's been a star in the FCAC for a long time. Hollis Mulry, a great uh, at attack, heading uh, west to USC. She's committed. A lot of great players in Coach Woods, obviously, Kristen Woods, one of the top coaches in the FCAC. But as you mentioned, Darianne in guys lacrosse and really in girls lacrosse is still one of the teams to beat and uh, maybe uh, help us get through a little bit of their lineup who are some of their returning players that make their unit really strong as they look to win their ninth straight FCAC title. They, it's just been title town in Darien for the girls over the last few years. Who are some of the players who two years after their first title are going to try to bring them back and win their ninth straight? Well, Shea Dolce and goal is probably... Uh one of the top goaltenders and not probably is one of the top goaltenders in the country. And so she's going to be really strong. They have Nell Niffen back. And I mean, we're talking about a strong Darianne team that may not have its best player all year. Ashley Humphrey, who has a stress fracture in her back. And unfortunately that's going to, they don't know whether they'll get her back or not. So uh, hopefully, hopefully she gets, some time in, gets to return for the postseason. We obviously want to see her play. She's she's a lot of fun to watch. And, uh, yeah, as you said, it's really too bad with New Canaan. Kristen's one of, Kristen's one of the, <clears throat> the great coaches and, and one of the great people in the FCAC. And uh, I was supposed to go tomorrow and work on a – you mentioned the Harden sisters. And uh, if they're listening, I'm still doing the feature story on you. We're just going to be delayed a little bit. So, uh Hold tight, and as we get ready here, uh, we want to get to our interview with Jack McFarland. Just one other point of reference: uh, we haven't mentioned mentioned softball at all. Yep, in the softball world, really, it's uh, you mentioned just to kick that off. St. Joe's Trumbull, uh, crosstown rivalry, and St. Joe's Dave. That's going to be the team to beat in the FC Act this year for softball. An outstanding twelve nothing win over their crosstown rival Trumbull. Bring us through that lineup a little bit and expand on your thoughts there about a St. Joe's team that really looks unstoppable, and they certainly did this weekend. Yeah, twelve nothing win over Trumbull, and everybody came in saying it's a it's a St. Joseph Trumbull uh, a St. Joseph Trumbull league this year, and uh, I guess we'll find out if uh, if the Cadets are twelve runs better than Trumbull, and Trumbull's the the number two team, and, and we've got some other good teams in the league as well. Fairfield Ludlow strong, Stanford strong, Staples is a sleeper, and I'm actually going to be over to see St. Joseph against Staples on Wednesday. So it's going to be an interesting year. Actually, here uh, I, I actually just got a text message from Kristen because I had taped her before, mm-hmm. <laughs> texted her before asking if they're going to 
if it was true they're in quarantine. And uh, I have a, a sad face emoji from from Kristen. So always uh, a, always uh, trying to you know bring the excitement or not bring the excitement, but uh, she is a child at heart. She's got a great uh, energy about her, but obviously not a lot of uh, cheering to go around with this news. No, nah, it's it's unfortunate. So let's hope uh, you know we got a, a great kickoff to the spring season. Opening day was, was just a lot of fun. It was nice to to be outdoors. It was nice to see everybody. I've spoken about five, six different coaches since Saturday. And every one of them just talked about the best thing is there was like buzz wherever they're, they were playing, a lot of electricity. So uh, let's hope uh, no more quarantines and, and a lot of good sports. Ian, I'm real excited to have you on the podcast this spring. So thanks a lot for helping me and assist. And uh, let's get to my interview with Staples baseball coach Jack McFarland. We'll be back in a moment. We're back. As we've discussed, FCAC baseball season is underway. There are a lot of interesting opening games, and I think uh, a lot of the eyes on Saturday were on Staples, the defending FCAC and state champion. Big game against Darien. Two teams, Staples came into the game ranked number one in, in the preseason poll. Darien's always strong, and uh, we got to see the debut of Carter Kelsey, Seton Hall bound pitcher, and he lived up to expectations as uh, he threw the first six innings of a no hitter, got uh, 12 strikeouts. Uh, Matt Spader came in and, and struck out the side. So Staples got off to a real impressive start with a 6 nothing win. And joining me right now is the Wreckers coach, Jack McFarlane. Jack, uh, thanks a lot for taking the time here. Hey, hey Dave, thanks for having us on. Uh, probably not a lot. Uh, I don't know what you could complain about yesterday. Opening day, you never know what's going to happen. And uh, Carter made your life pretty easy. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, we gave Carter the ball, and you know, we have high expectations for him. And he, you know, he, like you said, he lived up to the expectations. You know, he's a big kid. He's six four, two hundred thirty pounds, and he's going to come right at you. And you know that that's what he did yesterday. And, and we're going to talk about how things are different after a year off, but what was the Carter Kelsey you remember as a sophomore and what was the Carter Kelsey uh, that you saw yesterday? What was the big difference? Yeah, well, Carter's, <laughs> Carter's a 10th grader was, you know, the, the sky was the limit. I mean, he's got a huge frame. He threw the ball hard. And he just needed to, you know, to tighten some things up with his mechanics. Um, he worked with a couple guys I know, and, you know, he – he really worked on, you know, getting the ball in the strike zone because, you know, it's great to throw the ball 91 or 92, but, you know, not getting, getting the ball in the strike zone, it's, you know, you can't defend the walk. So he's, you know, he's really improved and worked hard on his craft. What sort of things? I mean, I, I came over, I covered the lacrosse game and I came over, watched about three, three and a half innings and, uh, cup. I mean, number one, he just throws really, really hard. And number two, uh, he's not trying to fool you. He, you know, it's basically I'm coming with my best stuff. Beat me. Yeah, the thing I love about the way Carter pitches, that even though there's not a lot of contact because he gets a lot of strikeouts, he he works fast and keeps everybody in the game. He gets the ball and he throws it. You know, some guys go out there and they're they're walking around and they're you know, it's they're not moving the game along. Carter's going to come right at you and the game's going to go. So you got to get in the batter's box and be ready. And, you know, he keeps the infielders and the outfielders in the game, which is what you want as a coach. That's got to be a big benefit, just uh, even though your your fielders know they're not going to get as much action as they are uh, when somebody else is pitching. Just to, we're, we're, with all the uncertainty, I mean, you go in and you're playing Darian. Did you really know anything about about? the blue wave other than that they're traditionally a good program. And when Mike Scott, they're well coached. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, all those coaches are flying blind as far as that goes, you know, with a two year hiatus, but you know, we, you know, we knew they would be, you know, well coached and a, a solid team. And then that's exactly what they were. And, and I mean, their pitching, their pitching certainly wasn't bad. Their starter did a good job on you, uh, you know, for first four or five innings before uh, before you're able to break open a two nothing game. 
yeah, definitely. Um, he, you know, could get through to a real nice game. Started working in his breaking pitches, and um, you know, as, as we finally started making some adjustments. But you know, he he really he really kept Darian in the game. This can be the year of the pitcher in the FCAC. I mean, you, you look around, uh, you figure Carter was the FCAC leader in strikeouts. And you see over at uh, Trumbull, Brian Krauss in, in six and a third, struck out 14, beat St. Joe's 5-1. And then uh, Wilton, uh, a one nothing pitcher's duel, they, they won against uh, Ridgefield. And, and Nevin Belanger struck out eight and six innings. Uh, there were a couple of high-scoring games yesterday, too. But just looking around, one of the themes uh, seemed to me in the preseason is uh, really good pitchers around the league. Oh, no question. I mean... Ridgefield's got two real good pitchers, and I think they split the game with them yesterday. I think Wilton and they had only one or two hits in that game. So I know they have some couple arms, uh, you know, the Wilton kid. I know Norwalk's got two or three arms. You know, Greenwich, had, Greenwich has a kid going to Vanderbilt, and they also have a left-hander. So the, the, there's definitely some pitching in the league this year. What about e, the Rutgers? Uh, it's two years away your preseason number one, uh, you know, some of that is is based on the talent that you have coming back. Some of it, I'm sure, for, from some of the people who vote not from the area based on reputation. Uh, what's it like after being a year away and and having the bullseye? Is it just basically you guys have been used to having the bullseye on you for, for a bunch of years now? Yeah, well, we have high expectations at Staples. I mean, we've been in the state finals three out of the last five years, so we're, we've been pretty much in that top five for for a while. And it was a little bit of a surprise we were number one, but it wasn't. You know, we thought maybe it'd be somewhere in the top five. Um, yeah, at this point, Dave, I you know the bullseye, you know that goes both ways. You know, teams, you know, a lot of teams are you know they'd love to beat Staples. It'd be a signature win. But with that said, you know, sometimes you grab the bat a little tighter. You want to beat, you know, it It works both ways. I think, um, you know, having high expectations is, is something that, that we preach and we, we try to thrive on. What are some of the other strengths? Uh, you saw <clears throat> Alex Oppenheimer, your, your highly touted shortstop, uh, hit a blast over the left field fence. Uh, defensively, you guys look solid, even though your fielders didn't really have too much uh, – too much of an opportunity to make plays. What what do you see as being some of the other strengths? And are there any areas that you see as being question marks? Yeah, we, we listen. We got a lot of work to do. The worst thing that can happen for you as a coach is you to peak in your first game, and then the rest of the season you don't get any better. So we have we have a lot of things we can get better at. Um, you know, let's see the lineup hit the ball a little more. Uh, you know, defensively, you know, there's still going to be. You know, we have some some dual. We have some. Um, pitchers and fielders so when they come in and pitch you know we have to have other guys come into key positions like first base and shortstop so you know it's going to be a little bit of a challenge and it's going to be a work in progress how difficult was dealing with this pandemic and having having a year away uh let you know going into an average season how much further behind were you this year knowing what you had oh, way behind. I mean, I tried to work hard last summer cause they were still playing in the summer just to see some kids, but you know, basically flying totally blind on the ninth and the 10th grade class. Now, usually as a coach, if your freshmen come in and you're not quite sure who they are, you hear some things, but that was ninth and 10th this year. So really had to do some uh, work during tryouts and actually get out and come and see these kids and really make some hard uh, decisions, you know, with, with not a lot of data or not a lot of, you know, first time in the program as a tenth grader. How many? How many positions? Would, you know, you, usually you have an idea who's going to be starting at, at a bunch of positions, unless you have maybe a couple of spots. You have a few people even. How, how many positions did you know going into first day of practice were pretty much locked up? You know, I want to say maybe three or four, and I want to say maybe we have two or three still. Still, I've got guys that are, you know, that can go either way that we're going to give, keep giving shots until somebody actually wins the job. So, you know, we have 13, 14 pretty good kids that, that are in the mix to, to start every game. Have there been, uh, again, I don't think there are too many instances where coaches are absolutely, you know, shocked or surprised uh, because even 
if you have underclassmen coming in, you, you know a little bit of something about what they've been doing before. I mean, did you have any instances where were one or two kids just completely shocked you with how good they were and you didn't expect it? <laughs> well, there are, there's a couple of basketball kids I call them the unicorns. Uh, Ethan Cooperi is a shortstop, and I got a, the center on the basketball team. He's a six-seven sophomore, left-handed pitcher, which was real, real well. And uh, you know, we're really trying to work those kids in and, and teach them, you know, to, to play at this level, you know, in, in the coming weeks. So yeah, I'm blanking on his name. He's going to be. Uh... Um, he had a couple of really good games for the basketball team. What's yeah, his? Chris Sajak. Okay, okay. Yeah, and he's a left-handed pitcher, six seven, and he's a 15-year-old kid. So we're going to try to, you know, work him in and, and work the shortstop in. And, you know, they were part of that 10th grade class that we never saw. So that, that was definitely a pleasant surprise. How about just in terms of health protocols, what – what things are really different? Uh, what are the most difficult things that you have to overcome with dealing with this? Well, you know, Dave, the preseason has just been brutal. I mean, we got a huge packet, you know, 60 page packet on the protocols. And, uh, you know, every single day we get a quarantine list on what kids is, is out for 14 days and what kids coming back. It's been the most exhausting, you know, preseason that I, in 16 years I've ever had. I'm sure I'm sure the same for all the coaches and the ads and people up at the CIAC. It's been, you know, kind of a labor of love just to get these kids out on the fields to play the spring. I mean, yesterday in Westport to see a big time baseball game at one o'clock, which the place was packed, and then a big time lacrosse game after that. I mean, you know, the people that came out was just unbelievable. I mean, there's a big pent up demand. You know, to, to just watch these kids play and for these kids to get out and start doing what they love. I got to tell you, just talking personally, and, and I was over there and I covered the lacrosse game, but I got there early because I wanted to come uh, see both you and Darianne. I don't remember. I don't remember. I'm sure there's some point. I don't remember just really, really, really being into the start of a, of a season. It's, you know, I, I've been cooped up and, and because of my own personal choices, I don't really go out too much. And just getting out there is a beautiful day and seeing everything. I, I don't remember having more fun on an opening day in a long time. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I looked around in the third inning and it was like it was like an outdoor concert. I couldn't believe how many people were there for a baseball game. You know, and it was kind of the same. We scrimmaged up at Amity. There were hundreds of people there. So. You know, everybody's ready. This is kind of like the beginning, I think, of trying to get back to normal. And I think, you know, a big indicator of that is that we're going to have a state tournament, which is going to really signal to everybody that, okay, we're, maybe we're turning the corner or we're at the back end of this pandemic. What about just looking around the league a little bit? Uh, just the sense I get, and that comes mostly from talking to some coaches and, and working on previews, which is where I always do a lot of my learning. Uh, seems like there's a lot of good teams. I mean, I kind of picked the top five, which uh, this year was more guesswork and, and relying on coaches more than, than I normally like. But uh, I think in, in previews, I asked all you guys for a top five team, and I think 11 different schools got mentioned. And uh, and I don't know right now that, that that's inaccurate. Just looking around, what happened? Yeah, I mean, based on what I what I see and what I know of certain certain teams, I think um, Trumbull's got a real solid roster. Uh, we were able to scrimmage Ward. I really like the pieces they have uh, at Ward. They got some, you know, I like their center fielder, I like their catcher. I'm hearing great things about Norwalk. They have some arms and they hit the ball. They've got a you know a young coach who is a friend of mine, great guy. So, you know, they're yeah. Here, you know, here in Ridgefield has some has some guys. Greenwich has is going to be much improved. They have a you know kid going to Vanderbilt and they have some pitching. So, you know, I think there's going to be some teams. It's going to be exciting. Even New Can New Canaan, they got a shutout yesterday against yeah. Uh, New Canaan much improved. Very strong up the middle with a catcher, a shortstop, and an outfielder. So, you know, that's the key to winning. Yeah, I know you're. Yeah, you've been high on Ward. You you talked them up to me a little bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch them today against West Cell, which which is another team that uh, could very well be in the mix. Yeah, no question. I'm sure I left out some teams, but they're you know, listen, there's a lot of kids playing baseball, 
And uh, a lot of kids that are, you know, going to colleges and going to D1, I think baseball in the last, you know, three or four years has definitely been been on the rise and really playing at a good level in Connecticut. I've been writing a lot about just we seem to be going through a, a golden era. Is there anything you can attribute that to? Is it kids playing a little bit more year round and, and there are a lot of great facilities in the area? Are we just going through a period where we just happen to have a lot of good players, a little of both, something else? Yeah, well, you know, what's always held back Connecticut when I played or has always been the weather constraints and, you know, the season was over, the season was over like you said, with these facilities that are around and, uh, you know, the coaching and teaching that's available year round, these kids can play. And they, they've decided that, Hey, I want to be a college you know, lacrosse player. I want to be a college baseball player. There's a little more specialization. You know, I think kids feel if they play three sports, they're just going to kind of be real good at three sports and they're never going to, you know, while they're playing basketball, maybe somebody's in the batting cage, you know, getting better than they are. So, you know, I, I definitely attribute to that because, you can play 12 months a year now. You can never do that. And, you know, kids are traveling too. They're going down to Georgia and Florida, which was, you know, nobody ever heard of that before. So there's all kinds of opportunities, you know, to, to get better. What percentage of your kids would you say are, are baseball only? Uh, I want to say probably 80%. That's a lot. Yeah. I mean, I think there's nothing wrong. I like kids who play two two or three sports. I, you know, I think three is hard nowadays with all the AP classes and everything. I think two is great. You know, if you're going to run track or play basketball or whatever, I think three is hard. But yeah, kids are specializing. I mean, you know, they're they're going out on a Tuesday night after homework and, and doing, you know, doing a hitting lesson or you know, whatever they do in the fall. I mean, it's really interesting. You are seeing more specialization. And, and I think that's due to because you can I, I don't know any sport now that you can't do year round or, or if it's an outdoor sport, you can't do indoor. But uh, I, I know a lot of the recruiters will tell you they like multi-sport athletes the best. Yes. Yep. So what do you think? What's uh, what's the key to, to Staples uh, staying at that top spot or, or somewhere very close to it? Well, number one, we got to stay healthy, you know, with, between the pandemic and, you know, and, you know, any kind of injuries would, would definitely derail, um, you know, gonna, it's going to derail any team. So staying healthy is number one. Number two, you know, it's pitching and defense, just, you know, catching the ball. You know, we pride ourselves on 21 outs. So, you know, we want to keep it at 21, 22, 23. We think once we get to 24, 25, and 26, we're giving the teams too many opportunities. And you know, you're not going to win games doing that. So we got to stay clean and uh, stay healthy. Have you done anything in terms of – telling your kids what you expect from them when they're not uh, at practice at games at school. Just I think now that we get outdoors, people are going to let their guards down a little bit. And uh, we know how easy it is for either, you know, some somebody cu- coming down with uh, with the COVID or even just having the misfortune of, of contact tracing or, or playing a team at the wrong time where they have – uh, some sort of an outbreak. Is there anything you've told your team in terms of what they may be doing socially uh, just to try to prevent anything, any instances with, with your players? Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about the mitigation constantly. We, we tell the kids it's all about choices. You know, we talk about the 2020 seniors that never got their senior year. And, you know, if you get caught up or if you, you know, if you decide to you know, end up at that party and get contact trace, you know, at this point of the season, anybody gets caught up in that, you're losing, you're losing seven or eight games, which is a third of your season. So, you know, there's going to be instances where there's nothing you can do about it. You went to a class and you did everything right and you're still on the list, but there's things you can do too. And that's what we talk about. That's such a tricky situation. And, uh, I mean, I, it, no, no matter how it happens, it's it, it's tough, and it, it's really tough if you just happen to play a team at the wrong time. We saw it in the winter time. Uh, hopefully, now that we're outdoors, it uh, we won't see too many instances. Uh, what's it like just to be back out coaching? We we've seen what it's like for you know talk to the kids and everything. I know what I was like for me. What what's it like after you're away just uh, to be out there doing something that that you really love and you're really good at. Well, yeah, I mean, like I said, the preseason was exhausting with all the paperwork and we had a ton of kids trying out. But now that the, the season started, it just feels great to be out there 
and seeing the kids put on the uniform and the joy that they get, you know, from playing, playing baseball. So, you know, I'm in the kid business and it's, you know, this is a great time of year. Well, I suspect uh, yesterday was a sign of, of things to come at Staples and, uh, it's always difficult to, to win an FCAC title and, and navigate that, the league, but you certainly look like you have the personnel to do it, and uh, you certainly have the tradition. So, Jack, uh, I wish you the best of luck this season, and thanks a lot for taking the time here to talk with me. You got it, Dave. Thanks for all you guys uh, do for the kids. Appreciate it. We're back, and uh, at the end of the first podcast, in spring and uh, the first uh, revised Rudin Report podcast. So uh, got a bunch of thank yous first to Jack McFarland, the Staples baseball coach. Appreciate him taking the time. And of course, to my new co-host, Ian Nicholas. Ian, what do you think? You're going to Gonna keep doing this with me? Uh, I don't know. The, I pat you're you're the broadcaster. Gas I'm not. Do, gas doesn't pay for itself down I ninety five, but I think I can afford the trip. I think the Rudin Report has the budget to uh, to make sure you're to to make sure that you're you're well transported, well fed, well whatever you need, and uh, you can uh, you're the broadcast expert here. You can uh, you can help carry me and make make me better at this. That's a win-win. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Ian, thanks a lot again. I want to thank Travis Bell, who is the best sound editor in the business. I want to thank him for manning the controls here and making this podcast sound great. Again, thank the Westport Library. And the views expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of Verso Studios or the Westport Library. Also, just a reminder that you can subscribe to the Rudin Report podcast on iTunes. A good review is always appreciated. And a reminder, too, that the Rudin Report newsletter is back out. We're publishing Monday and Friday mornings. We send the newsletter right to your inbox of your email. There are no charges at all, and you get content that you won't find on the site. I write something for each issue, so subscribe to the newsletter, and hey, let's have a great spring. I'm excited. Uh, Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again next week.